All right. Hello, everybody. It is, let's see, where are we? It's, it's July 18th, over halfway through the year here. Pretty crazy stuff. Um, anyway, I want to thank you guys for last week. Last week was a great call, but I didn't get through everything I intended to. So we're just going to kind of continue on this one. I know when I sent the email out last week and again this week, I said I had two important things to cover, which basically was the idea, the whole concept and idea behind lead magnets and how important those are. And we hit that pretty hard, but we didn't get to the second one, which was the big idea, the whole concept of the big idea. And I'm going to kind of get into that a little bit deeper today. Uh, so if you guys didn't see the last week's episode, whatever you want to call it, uh, we talked a lot about lead magnets. I actually put a video up for you guys in the training area. This is a really good video by Andy Jenkins. I know we discussed it last week. I put it up in two places in the, in the members area so you guys can get access to it. It's under the hook section where we talk about big ideas it's right there i also put it under the, the the next section down which is lead and landing pages because lead and landing pages really is where it talks about lead magnets so i thought both of those spots would be appropriate for that video it's a keep in mind the video is a cartra promotion video but the whole content behind it is talking about lead magnets, how not only how important they are, but how to actually create a really good one. Because, you know, in this, the video starts off talking about if Andy were to start over with nothing, what would be the most important thing and the path that he would take? And he's going to tell you it's by far getting leads. It's generating leads. Like when you do an advertisement, if you spend money on advertising and you're geared toward thinking that ad is going to generate sales, you're probably going to be saddened by the results. Your ads should be geared toward generating leads. That is the first piece of a sales process is generating a lead. Everybody gets too greedy and they want to they want to throw money at an ad and generate sales. And typically that doesn't happen. That's where your marketing funnel comes in. That's the whole job of the marketing funnel. Remember, when we talk about marketing funnels, there's a sequence to it. It's not just, you know, throw somebody on a sales page and make an order, take an order. Doesn't really work that way. It never has. It probably never will. It's about creating value. It's first about grabbing someone's attention. That's what we do with the, the front end. That's the lead. That is the ad. When you place an ad, the ad, the whole point of the ad is to grab someone's attention. Get them to look at what you're telling them. Get them to look at what you're offering them. So that's really important that you get that. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the whole big idea concept because that's what that's all about. The big idea is about figuring out, you know, what's important to your person and what's going to be really intriguing that they haven't heard. You've got to say the same thing in a different way they haven't heard before. And that way you're going to grab their attention. That's the first piece of the whole process to the marketing funnel is you've got to grab their attention. If you can't do that, then the rest of it is not going to have a chance because there's not going to have any eyeballs on your offers. So. Anyway, and that's where the lead magnet comes in. That's the piece that gets them to opt in for you. Remember, the first thing is we got to grab their attention. Now we've got to make them a free offer to get them to bite. You know, we're basically building a mousetrap here. So really important that you figure out what's important to them. And, you know, one of the, one of the key components to that is figuring out, like, Wherever they are and wherever they want to go, what's the first step? What's the first thing that you could solve? First problem you could solve for them. So anyway, I, uh, I want to get, I want to cover other things too on the call today. So we'll kind of come back to the big idea in a minute. Um, switching gears real, real quick. I know several of you guys are on here, you know, for the SEO portion 
and there's a lot of stuff going on in SEO right now. Uh, some of it real, some of it probably not. <laughs> uh, John Mueller, for those of you that don't know, that's like the new uh, Google representative. That's their mouthpiece, their PR machine, so to speak. Um, he is kind of taking the place of Matt Cutts. You know, if you guys have been around for a while, you probably remember him. Matt Cutts was like the big Google advocate. He was out telling people how to do SEO. He was a Google employee. And, you know, Google put him up to that. His job was basically to manage what went on in SEO. So he would come out, he would tell you what not to do. Now, from an SEO perspective, every time I heard that guy say not to do something, I knew that was important to actually do it. Because he's trying to tell you it's not important and he's trying to tell you it'll hurt you. And he's really trying to do that so you don't do it because there's a loop in the algorithm that there's something there that you can take advantage of and he doesn't want you to take advantage of it. So he'll tell you not to. Now, John Mueller is no different. He is just the new guy, the new face on the scene. And um, Andrew sent me a, a link the other day to an article in one of the big SEO uh, places that, you know, they, they publish articles about all things SEO. And the title of the article was Google does not use pogo sticking as a ranking factor. I clicked the link and sure enough, it's John Mueller saying just that. So just like when Matt Cutts would say something, it means the exact opposite. If they're telling you pogo sticking doesn't matter, then I'm telling you it does. <laughs> and we know that. We know that because and that's one of the factors that we take advantage of in, in our site pop software is pogo sticking. Google doesn't like it. It, if it negatively affects if you do it wrong, you know, like pogo sticking, what that is, let me, let me tell you what it is first. So you guys know, you don't think I'm just mumbling words here. Pogo sticking is when somebody clicks a link, goes to a site and they immediately jump to another site. It's like they're, they're hopping around. They haven't found what they wanted yet. And the, you know, the worst pogo stick of all is, is the back button. Like when you click, that's called a bounce. You know, you can also call pogo sticking bouncing. If people are clicking to your site and they're bouncing back, they've pogo sticked back off your site because they didn't like it. And to say that that's not an important factor to Google is absolute hogwash. So when I saw that article, I, I just started laughing. You know, it's like, this is just bringing back old old times, old memories from, from when Matt Cutts used to pull that crap. You know, it says, oh, don't, don't do this. It, you know, Google doesn't care. They don't pay attention to that when they really do. And they're just trying to get you not to take advantage of a loophole that, that is present. <laughs> so anyway, don't pay attention to that one because it's, it's just a, it's a blatant lie. And next, you know, I got another, uh, another thing. There's apparently been a big update uh, that has been released. And they, they're calling it, you know, the, I forget what they called it, the 2009 update. And um, Google does these updates all the time. They're, they're constant. They're constantly rolling out changes, especially with RankBrain. Now, sometimes they will analyze data and they'll do a, a larger rollout, and that's what just happened. And it was funny because all of the factors they were looking at really never made sense. It was like they couldn't figure out what really was affecting this, and ultimately, the only thing they could come up with was the sites, there's certain, whenever an algorithm shift happens or an update happens to the search engines, some sites will go up and some sites will go down. That, that's just the nature of it. When they change what's important, new sites will rise to the top and, and some are going to fall. That's just the way it works. So what you do is you look at the sites that rose and you look at the sites that fell and you try and determine what was the difference. Why did these go, to, go up when the others went down? 
and they couldn't find any legitimate reason for it. Like they looked at all the on-page factors, they looked at all the linking factors, and, and none of the factors that they were analyzing actually made sense. So what they ultimately came up with was what I've been saying for quite some time, is its authority. And apparently Google has figured out a new way to rate authority. A lot of people are writing books and becoming authors and all this stuff for fake authority. And what it looks like to me is Google has figured that out. The Google rank brain algorithm, the, the artificial intelligence has caught on to that. So if you've got links coming in and you're, you know, one of the examples that they used, they used this on multiple sites where it was, the sites were almost identical. You know, same content, same topic, same keyword, same everything. Yet one went up, one went down. And the site that went down had fake authority. The one that went up had real authority. Like in, in what I'm, what I'm kind of comparing there as far as authority, one of the sites was actually an MD, you know, a real medical doctor with actual medical links to real stuff. The other one was a mom blogger that had fake authority. You know, she wrote a book. She's an author. Uh, no real credentials. You know, she did she, not Amazon number one seller. You know, that's just fake authority, really. Anybody can do that. Not anybody can get an MD behind their name. So Google apparently, you know, they've kind of been looking at data for a very long time now. So they've figured out that is a ranking factor for trust. Google has trust factors. So, you know, if you're, if you're getting a lot of fake authority and you're up against people that have real authority, this algorithm might make a difference for you. It might affect you negatively. So something to think about. <laughs> John, can I ask you um, a question about that? Sure, uh, absolutely. Regarding, uh, so this old, like for a few years in marketing, you know, you know marketing. Yep. They've always said that uh, a, a quick way to become authoritative is to write a book, to mm -hmm. author a book, and these days, it's very easy to self-publish a book yeah. or, to, or to put an ebook on Amazon. Is that still a factor with this new update for Google? And that, that is exactly what I'm talking about. That's the kind that's of, not going to work. You, you're thinking it might not work as well. It still will work in the real world for providing credibility to your customers. But Google's caught on to it for a trust factor. That's, that's really the only thing that I'm, that I'm saying there is if you're, if you're hanging all your domain authority on that kind of stuff, Google's figured it out. <laughs> but having a book and, and you know, being published and all of that stuff can still, in the eyes of your clients, be important because it can separate you from other people that don't have that. But as far as a ranking factor, uh, that kind of stuff seem to have made a positive difference up until now. And, and, you know, Google made that shift. They've just apparently determined that that is no longer a, a trust authority factor for the algorithm. So it doesn't mean it's still not good, you know, as a business practice to do for your customers. And I don't think it's, it, it wouldn't negatively affect you like it's, it's not going to hurt your rankings. It's just not going to help them like it did. Does that okay. make sense? Okay. It's not like they're going to see, oh, well, you know, Anthony wrote a book, so we're going to penalize them for that. <laughs> they're not going to do that. <laughs> it's just, you know, if they gave you like a, a five trust factor before, now they might demote it to maybe a three. Okay, so, got it. So, it's, you know, it's not a major thing. It's, it's not anything that's going to like totally upset anybody's apple cart. But people are just, they're wondering, you know, what happened? Why did certain sites go up? Why did certain sites go down? And to me, that's the, that's the only thing that really makes sense for me to be able to piece together in, in what actually took place. And so they just kind of, it's just like linking, you know, when, when, uh, 
Google Panda came through and they wiped out all the link authority. You know, it, it wasn't like they were banning sites. They were just removing the positive thing they had before. It, it, everybody thought they got demoted, they got, they got penalized and all that. I didn't see it as a real penalty. I just saw it as a, as a shift in what was important. You know, yes, they lost rank, but they didn't truly get penalized. If you get penalized by Google, you know it. <laughs> they, they will flat wipe you off the face of the earth. If they feel you've done something wrong, look out. That's a penalty. But when you're talking about like true ranking uh, over long term, that's going to shift around what they value as important, and that's going to make you go up and down. That's a natural thing. It's always been there. It's not going to go away. Uh, you just have to get used to it. So, you know, back to the whole concept of cloud cover and the right way to do SEO, it, it all falls right back where it should have been to begin with is providing quality content for your customers and focusing on conversion. If you're focused on conversion, you're truly interested in what's important to them and providing a really quality experience. And that's what Google's going to see. That's what they're going to value. And if you're doing it that way, you'll get the right kind of incoming links. It will pass the right kind of people through to your site, and it will provide the right kind of user experience that Google will see, they'll take notice of, and they will reward you for that. You will get rewarded for good stuff. So uh, anyway, um, let's see. I've got a question here in the chat. Uh, before this, I'm just trying to figure out what uh, what the uh, what the question is here, Marlene. Do you want to come out and uh, and ask this? Maybe we'll figure out what uh, what you're trying to get to the bottom of there. Okay, I'm just trying to see. If, yeah, Marlene, you're still here. I'll unmute you. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Perfectly. So we um, utilized authoritative words uh, recommended by Google way back when, okay. and we had content very authoritative, both original works and works uh, from authoritative sources like the federal government and fair use places. Mm -hmm. But I took the live URLs off because I had a fear that viewers would click on to those URLs and go off into the, you know, off into the stratosphere and leave my website because I had enticed them to go to these wonderful outside authoritative sources. Oh, gotcha. My my host will not accept frame pages. Okay, gotcha. So so you removed links that were going out off to other other places, basically. Just left it as text and not. A live hyperlink. Okay. There's nothing wrong with actually linking out. And in fact, that is a trust factor. When you link out to other sources, that Google actually sees that as a trust factor. Because if you were like a spammer or scammer or what have you, and you were really greedy about everything, you wouldn't do that. So they they actually see that as a trust factor. So I would put the links back in. The only difference is I would make the link rather than just a straight link out, I would make the link open in a, in a new window. So they don't actually leave your site. It opens another window where they can view that content from that external ah, site. Okay. But then when they close out, they're back to you. So they didn't actually leave your site. That's okay. That's the way I would do that. But that outgoing link, believe it or not, that is an authoritative trust factor. The fact that you link out and are willing to send your visitors to something that is useful to them, Google sees that as a big plus. Okay. The links 
went to authoritative websites of how to handle medical emergencies if uninsured, if you need government help, uh, if you need advisors. These are all free, nonprofit, mm -hmm. immediately available. And, and I wrote a book on it and at one point published it. I wonder if I should bring the book back updated. Yeah. Yeah, I would say you definitely, you have a reason to have those links on your site. So there's there's an absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think okay. you'll, you'll get a positive result from having those. The only thing, you're, you're right, if you send them off your site, now all of a sudden, you know, you lost your web traffic. So you don't want to do that. So just when you when you create the link going out, just have it pop up in either a new window or a, a new frame. Okay, and authoritative words that not just as keywords in my meta meta keywords, but to weave them through the content so that they are relevant. Um, Google's keywords were authority, authoritative, um, research, uh, proven. Um, the whole list of about a hundred words that are authoritative, and so in the old website, we were on the the listing of the first 10 for our five top keywords but as soon as we went to the deadly website new website builder everything collapsed <laughs> i will go back to the old way there must be something to be said about being so highly organically ranked um and do it the way we did it before yeah yeah i would go back to to what worked for sure all right thank you as far as like content and having you know your words repeated uh, that used to be a big thing to repeat the word over and over and over throughout your whole page. That's not so much important anymore. In fact, that that can be looked at as negative. What's what you want to do is try and replace those words with relative words, words that are related. They call it LSI, which means latent semantic indexing, and that's just a fancy word for for uh, words that are in a in a particular bucket that belong to you. synonyms in other words synonyms relevant not, synonyms not necessarily synonyms but that it could be like lsi would be like if your keyword were baseball an lsi okay. term might be stadium which doesn't mean anything to do with baseball but it's related because baseball happens inside a stadium um like box seats second base, first base, outfielder, all of those terms are relevant to the word baseball. Okay. So like in, you know, in yours, if it was a particular medical term, all medical type terms might be considered related. You know, like doctor's office could be a relative term, just like stadium is to baseball, uh -huh. doctor's office would be to your phrase. So, uh, you know, Gregory says industry jargon. Yeah, it's it's basically anything that's that's related that Google connects. And what they're really trying to do, I, I've used this example before, some words have multiple meanings. So by connecting the words to the meaning, to the words that are meaningful to that word, Google understands, okay, I know what to rank this for. And, you know, I've used the word cougar before. Cougar has multiple meanings. Cougar was an old car from the 70s. Cougar is an animal that, you know, cruises through the hills. And it's also considered, a, you know, an older female could be considered a cougar as well. Uh, Google's job is to figure out what the, the actual meaning of the word is. So when somebody has a, a, a search phrase, it can kind of give them the right results. So that's where LSI comes in, is bringing in all those related terms to kind of make sure that they understand the meaning of the core term. So that, that's why that's so important. A good way to do that, an easy way to kind of figure out what those terms might be, when you run a search for your, your search phrase in Google itself, scroll to the bottom of the page and it will actually show you related keywords. Those are all LSI keywords. And sometimes they're not the same. You know, sometimes like baseball will have stadium there, you know, something like that. And that'll give you a good idea from Google's eyes what do they feel is related to that term. And if you can take those keywords and you can integrate those into your content, 
what happens is you will actually start ranking for those other terms as well. And it really does you a huge benefit there. And so okay. that, that can, that can really give you a big boost by using the right words in your, in your copy. Um, um, so taking it back to the idea of the big idea and of these LSIs, mm -hmm. how close do I want to get in these keywords that are scattered, authoritative keywords scattered around to complement the big idea? Or ha are they irrelevant? Are they mutually exclusive? The big idea and the content and keywords, are they, do they have to be uh, connected somehow in idea or are they independent of each other? They're, they're kind of, kind of both. <laughs> and it depends on which way you view it. Like a lot of times we'll create marketing pages just to test traffic. So we're not really concerned with search results We're we know we're just going to buy traffic and we're going to send it there. And it's all, it's going to go to a, a page with a big idea on it. So we're not really keyword focused when we do that. We're more focused to the user intent, the buyer intent, what's important to the, to the person that we're trying to grab their attention. Now, ultimately, once you figure all your stuff out and you figure out what, what keywords are important to your viewers, you will want to take those big ideas and you'll want to bring those into your website, into all of your pages. Like when you do keyword research, SEO, I'll, I'll kind of just separate SEO from traditional marketing just for a second so you can kind of get the, the idea. They do come back and they do blend together, but it, it's a process. So if you were focused on SEO, for instance, you'd be doing <laughs> keyword research to figure out what keywords your, your prospects are searching for. From that, you would take that information and you'd say, okay, knowing what is important to these people, I want to rank for these keywords. I want to create a big idea that's important when these people land here. So with that in mind, those keywords would naturally become probably part of your big idea. Okay. But if you're doing like a big idea just to test traffic or something like that, it's not important to, you know, stuff a bunch of LSI keywords in there, but it will probably happen naturally. You know, just by just by virtue of the way this thing works, it'll probably happen just on its own. <laughs> so that's how that's how you really know you're you know you're on track when your natural languaging comes through and it just contains all those LSI keywords anyway. And that's okay. How, that's how Google also knows too. So. All right, that helps. All right. I think. Awesome. I think there has to be a synergy. I'm starting to pick up there needs to be a synergy between the big idea, the content, and the keywords. Yes. And, and really, the, the synergy all revolves around your customer. It's, it's what is important to them is really going to make the difference for you at the end of the day, whether you connect with them or not. And okay. if you don't connect with them, they might come to your site and just leave. So you're never going to convert. So that's why I'm really focused more these days on conversion than I am traffic. Traffic is like easy. Traffic is the thing that you can just go out and buy traffic, but you can't buy the conversion. You have to really figure out how important things are to your customers and, and how to translate that. How do, how, do, how do you grab their attention and create demand and desire because what you have is going to deliver the result they're looking for. If you can convey that message, that's how you drive desire. That's how you create desire. And I always talk about this. There's two parts to every person. You know, there's two people living inside each one of us. It's like we've got the, the ego and the alter ego, whatever you want to call it. But there, there really is. This is totally true. And and I break it down to it's the conscious and the subconscious. And both of those things are at play. It's like the conscious mind is the one that does the talking. The subconscious does the listening. And it, it's the one that drives. It's the one that, that really gets things done. So in marketing, what that means is as I look at the subconscious as the heart, 
and the head is the is the conscious mind that's the one that does the speaking and the thinking and the and the heart really just kind of does what it's told but the heart is where all of our desires live you know the heart is what wants things the head doesn't want anything the head just you know wants to object to everything and be be a pain in the ass <laughs> It, it's the heart. So when I, when I talk about marketing, I say you have to seduce the heart and then convince the head because the head's where the objection is going to come from. And the reasoning behind it, you know, this is just psychological, you know, this goes way back in history. The, the whole purpose of the head is to protect the heart. You know, the heart, the head does not want the heart to get broken. So if the heart wants something, the head's going to be the first one to step in the way and say, no, I don't buy it. And we're not getting that because I don't want you to get hurt again. You know, like, you know, if you had bought diet pills and they didn't work, next time you're offered that, the heart still wants it because the heart wants to lose the weight and look good and all that stuff. But the head's going to step in the way and say, no, we tried that before. It didn't work. We're not falling for that again. So in, you know, in marketing, you have to do those two things. You have to seduce the heart by figuring out what it wants. And then you have to eliminate the objections by figuring out what they are. And that's how you seduce the heart, convince the head before you make an offer. If you make an offer before you've convinced the head, the answer is going to be no, you know, because the head's going to step in and say, no, not buying it. Well, you know, we're not, we're not going for that again. <laughs> well, one of your um, participants last week, I think it was last week, gave me a great clue. Um, cancer blog going on, talking to people and finding out it wasn't really what she needed. It, 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 it didn't serve her. And that triggered the thought about how do you know when you go onto a website to look for a doctor, what's going to meet your needs? What do you want most? And what they seem to want most when I'm researching this is they want access and a friend. When they're looking for a doctor, yeah. they need to know they can get to you. And they need to know, even if you're not perfectly knowledgeable about the topic, their topic, that you will be their friend and you will find out for them what they need to feel better. And, yes. and to be better. And her comment just clicked in my head. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that is interesting. When you just said that, it kind of it kind of triggered something for me that I've seen uh, over and over. I learn by observation a lot. And what I've learned is if you watch movies, a lot of times you'll see stuff in movies that they've figured out what's really important and they key in on it. And that's why the movie is so great. And what you just said about that doctor access, I don't know how many movies I've seen where it involves a pregnancy. And the most important thing to that expecting mother is that doctor is going to be there when she gives birth, it's going to, she's going to have access. And like, if they're on vacation, they freak out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that, it's that, yeah, it's that friend. It's that familiarity. It's that, that known trusting person being there for you every step of the way and never being absent. So you might really be onto something there. Cause you know, like I said, when I see the stuff in movies, I, I, I pick this all up by observation of what's important to who and why and how. And, uh, and I've seen that particular thing over and over and over in movies. You know, they get attached to this one particular doctor. And when they step out of the way and, and try and bring in somebody else, that person just flips out. It's not a good experience. <laughs> so anyway, that... Uh, Joe wants to know about the gut, the gut reaction. You know, where does that fall into the, the heart and the head? And the, the gut is more, that's more feelings and belief, I think. And I, I think that really probably shifts up more to the head. Because when you look at the subconscious, the subconscious doesn't differentiate. Uh, all it knows is what's true. And the, the way it knows what's true is what the head tells it. Like when you're talking, the subconscious is listening. 
So this is really important. This happens to a lot of children and it negatively affects them throughout their entire life. They hear something and it didn't even come from themselves. Someone told them something, their subconscious listened, and it created a value that will, it will never change unless you physically change it. So, you know, like, like the whole thing of when, when children are told money don't grow on trees, <laughs> they're, they're basically telling you that money is hard. Money is not easy. Money is scarce. And that can affect a kid as they grow and they go into adulthood and the, for the rest of their life, that can put a limitation on that person that they'll never break. They will never be successful because of that. And it's because it, it really, it was set. It, that, that belief was set by someone else. And, you know, it's really easy to change those beliefs. Like Benjamin Franklin, he knew how to change beliefs. Every objection is based on a belief. No matter who, who said it, the subconscious has the belief. And, and the head is going gonna, gonna to play on that. So to change a belief is really easy. You know, Benjamin Franklin had the formula. It's claim contrary to the belief, proof making it not just a claim, but making it a fact, and then attaching it to the benefit of what the heart really wants. That's how he was able to eliminate any objection before he made his offers. That's why he was so powerful as a marketer. He's in the Marketing Hall of Fame basically because of that. And that formula is still used today by every you know, known marketer that knows about it and every ad agency. They know about that. They know how to use that. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. <laughs> but again, you know, it, it's all, it's all back to, uh, back to marketing. You know, it's, I relate it all back and how we can use it to our advantage to, uh, you know, to move forward and to effectively convert more sales. Cause that's what it's all about. We want to take prospects and we want to educate them in why we're the best solution for them. You know, as business owners, that's what we want. We want our solution to be seen as the best. That way people will purchase it. So the way we do that is by education. You know, it's educating them on how this works, why we're the best, why we're different. All the way through, that creates more demand and desire for the heart. And hopefully, it will be eliminating the objections as well. So when you make your offer, you convert like crazy. That's how you get high converting offers. That's where, you know, you see people that they'll spend money on ads and they won't convert and they'll get very low, very low conversions. And it's probably because they made their offer before they created the demand and desire, that before they created the value, before they eliminated the objections. This happens quite often when you run an ad and you send them right to a sales page. You haven't had time to build up a relationship with that person. You haven't had time to educate them. You haven't had time to build the demand and desire and eliminate the objections. You went right to the offer and it didn't work. And now you kick the dirt and you say, ah, oh, this advertising thing didn't work. <laughs> what did you expect? You know, would that ever work in the real world? Never. It doesn't. It never did. It never will. You know, if you do it right, they'll whole, uh, you know, and back to the, our original point of this call that when I started, the whole idea of the, the hook and the lead magnet. When you run an ad, the best thing to try and focus on is to create a lead. You're generating a lead. You're not trying to make a sale yet. You're trying to generate a lead so you can put them into the process and educate them. Build the demand and desire, eliminate the objections, and then make your offer. Then you're going to convert like crazy. Uh, Joe, you had your, your hand up. You got a question here you want to pop out with? Yes. Thank you, John. Go Great on. information again. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a book called The Power of Habit. I'm just reading the chats here, and uh, that book resonated with me because for instance, I know my mother, when she stopped smoking, 
the hardest part was like after dinner, lighting up that cigarette mm -hmm. or picking up the phone. So it's a habit. And what I learned from that book is, you know, people like uh, businesses like Procter and Gamble, they got that down to like a science. We spoke about this, right? Yeah. Like yeah. they know when people, you know, when people are pregnant before they know it. Uh-huh. I'm not Procter and Gamble. <laughs> is there a way for me to like see, like I know my avatar and I think I just answered my own question, but uh, <laughs> to find like their patterns and like time, like my, you know, my sequences in, in Kartra. D does that make sense? Yeah, your your sequence, really your sequence is, remember I talked about the education process. Yeah. That's what your sequence is. Like give them good information. It, and you know, on the timeline where they are, they're in a they're in a state of of discomfort generally. Whether you put them there or not. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we'll actually put them there. They'll be in a state of bliss, not not even knowing they have a problem, like in your case. You know, they just know, hey, I'm, a, I'm in business. I'm a sole proprietor. I'm doing great. And then you come in and say, yeah, dude, you're about to get audited. You're about to get audited. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now how do I? And all of a sudden, I went from the state of bliss to, oh, no, I'm better, you know, grab my ass. <laughs> right. And, so and, and now like, you go through this, like seven stages of grief. <laughs> so, like now I've shocked them. I got their attention, right? yeah now how do I know, like what's the next step when do i well here know? here's your opportunity to map out what it takes to take them from where they are which is that that state of discomfort and take them to where they want to be which is safe and you know safe okay, so and it, making money and it's not really about their habits then no not in this case okay in this case it's okay. about it's about transformation from where they are to where they want to be okay so i gotta look more at the timeline yeah okay. and the timeline will reveal like if you can break down what steps it takes maybe there's 10 steps to take them from where they are to transform them to where they want to be and if there's 10 steps the first lead magnet the best lead magnet is the first thing to take that first step you know like in your case their their first thing is confusion they know, okay, God, I, I can't be a sole proprietor anymore. I need to be incorporated. But now there's this LLC, there's a C Corp, there's an S Corp. Now I'm confused. So your first step is to eliminate that confusion and tell them what they actually need. That's your first lead magnet. So when you give them that, you've all of a sudden taken them and eliminated that frustration for them. Now they feel better. They're still not where they want to go. You gave them very useful, but incomplete information. On purpose, because that's what you taught me to do. That's right. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're creating a huge demand for, okay, I, I took the first step. This is awesome. What do I do now? And now they're looking to you for advice. This is your opportunity to educate them on the process and lead them to the promised land. All right, is this where I tell them that I'm the only one in the world that could fix this for them? Not necessarily. You want them to figure that out. You want them to come to that conclusion on their own. Okay. You don't want to come out and just, you know, say that because <laughs> that, is an, that is a non-believable statement. <laughs> yeah. if, if you throw a statement out like that, you better have the proof to back it up. <laughs> And you don't want to you don't want to make statements in marketing that cause conflict. Okay, <laughs> so, I can do that very easily. Yeah, so <laughs> so this is this is just your opportunity to provide value, like you, okay. you walk them through the process. And your first offer might be, you know, if you want to do this yourself, it's not that hard. I can show you how to do it. I have a course. It's ninety-seven bucks, and it'll walk you through the processes and make sure that you don't screw something up. You know, it'll make sure you get it right the first time and it'll save you from having, you know, all these penalties and what have you. And then when you walk them through that, now you're, you're teaching them how to do that. And then all of a sudden they're, they're figuring it out on their own that, hey, this is the right guy for me. 
this is the guy I trust. This is the guy I want to just do this for me. And that's where you make them another offer of, hey, you know, if this sounds like it's more than more than you want to buy it off, hey, for another hundred bucks, I'll do it for you. I do this all day long and, you know, it's not a problem. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'll do you a favor. I'll just take care of it for you. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's that whole process. Yeah, that, that's, that's your auto response sequence. That's your invite to future webinars. That's your, that's your education process. Yeah, I think you've been telling me this for a couple of years, but now it's just starting to click. <laughs> I, I will keep Very playing cool. it as long as it takes. <laughs> Thanks, it John. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't mind repeating myself at all. I, I've, I often say that I'm like, I, I hate to say this again, but I, I feel it's so important because everybody gets it at their own time. You know, everyone's on a different, different pace, a different place and all of that. And it's really important that, that ultimately you all come to the same conclusion of this all works a very specific way. That's the why ad agencies do things the way they do them because it works. There's a process to it. That's what I, that's why I assembled the whole thing and put it into the ACT program so everyone had a clear path of how to do it, how to accomplish it. So, and the more I do it, the more I absolutely love it because it's so, it's so similar throughout everyone's business. It's like everyone needs to do the same thing. It doesn't matter what you do or what you sell. It's the way things work. And uh, it's it's just the more I, the more I get into it, the more I absolutely love the process because it does work and it works for everybody. <laughs> and if you see, like when I'm talking to you, Joe, and I'm I'm talking to to Russ about his sun umbrellas, and you know I'm I'm talking to Donna about her her animal products, uh, you know, with the with the the light therapies, it's it's all the same thing. The core is the same thing it's just different language but you know it's figuring out what's important to your people and figuring out what language they speak and communicating you know because they all want the same thing they want to they want to go from where they are which is that state of discomfort to where they want to be their desired outcome and if we can connect what we offer in the middle to provide that outcome they're going to want to buy it, whatever it is, they're going to want to buy it. The only thing that's going to prevent it is an objection. So if we can identify, eliminate, make an offer, we will convert very well and we'll all make money. <laughs> so it's a, it's just a, a cool thing. It's a cool process. Um, back to your smoking thing. You had mentioned something about, about the smokers and, and I find this to be really interesting I know a guy that that actually uh, uses the psychology stuff to eliminate smoking, and what he what he had told me was he said most smokers, almost all of them, the reason they can't stop smoking is because their subconscious believes they're addicted, and they're really not. And in a general conversation, he will allow he he will create a conversation that will bypass the conscious mind and speak to the subconscious mind and let it figure out it really has not addicted. And that's why it keeps doing the, the, the habit, if you want to call it over and over and over. And it changes the habit like in a snap. And, and the conversation goes something like this. Uh, you know, it's, you probably can't stop smoking because you are addicted. Most people think they're addicted to smoking, but really they're, they're not addicted because addiction, or actually they, they don't say that they're not addicted. They let the subconscious figure that out. They say, you know, people that are addicted, they can't sleep more than an hour without waking up and having to have a hit of whatever it is. And they ask the question, you know, do you sleep through the night or do you have to get up every half hour and have a smoke? And most people will say, no, I, I sleep through the night. And just by that association, their subconscious figures out, oh, I'm not really addicted. So that, that doesn't work anymore. 
the, the wanting a cigarette because I think I'm addicted or I've told myself I'm addicted, all of a sudden that's broken now. So the craving for cigarettes disappears instantly because it was all driven by that, that untrue fact that the subconscious believed. So anyway, I, I didn't mean to, you know, get off on something that you guys may or may not believe or be into, but that's, you know, that's a lot of ways how they get rid of smoking addictions. So, and, and the reason I even brought it up was it's the same thing in marketing to eliminate objections because mo every objection is based on a belief. And if you can convince the subconscious, the belief isn't true, you've just eliminated the objection. And now you can go ahead and make your offer and it will fly. And eliminating the objection happens instantly. Once the subconscious, the subconscious doesn't think about things. It only listens and it accepts information. If you tell it something's true, it takes it at face value instantaneously. It does not take time to train it. <laughs> so pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Another thing back to SEO. If you guys have links to G+, get rid of them. G plus doesn't exist anymore. So basically you've got broken links on your site to stuff that doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. G plus was Google's social media platform that they created. Everybody jumped on it. Um, I know I've still got G plus links on my site. I'm going to probably go in and remove today. I don't know how recently it was removed, but I do know this morning when I checked, uh, the links are no good anymore. So if you've got G plus links in your social media uh, profiles, kill them. They're done. <laughs> Get rid of them. Uh, let's see. Okay, we talked about the trust factor with uh, with Rank Brain. Covered the lead magnets again. Pogo sticking. All right. I think I have pretty well covered everything. So, does anybody have anything else, or should I loop back to the big idea here? I've got a question, John. Just quickly. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Andrew. Cheers, man. Uh, great call, by the way. Um, very interesting, all the addiction stuff. I've got the T-shirt there, like. <laughs> <laughs> 15 years experience. I'm like, I'm like a walking guinea pig. <laughs> but, yeah, I've, I mean, lots of, there's lots of, lots of people going on about mobile first indexing. I don't know if you've covered that or not on a previous call that I've missed. Uh, yeah, but it's we... interesting to me. Have you done that, have you? Yeah, we haven't we haven't really covered uh, the mobile first indexing, but I I can tell you for sure, there was a long time when people were talking about that and it wasn't true. It yeah. was like it was like you know it was the same whether you were on a desktop or a mobile. That has shifted now. I can tell you yeah. for sure. And if you go into SEM Rush, SEM Rush has a toggle now where you can toggle from desktop to mobile, and you'll see your 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 ranking is very different now. Whether how that, sorry, how is that in relation to AMP pages then? Well, AMP has got like a billion different different pages that are flagged, <laughs> flagged up all over the place in SEMrush, and it's like this has all got to be connected, you know. And so I was just wondering. Yeah, I I never really got into the inner workings of uh, of the the AMP stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm not really sure. I'd have to take a look and see what exactly they're doing. I think that was something that Google was offering to help increase the speed of the mobile pages. Well, from what, what my understanding of it is that it basically they just literally host the mobile page if it's not quick yeah. enough. It's an automatic yeah. thing, which is pretty clever if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and it's same with Facebook, isn't it? You know, it opens within Facebook, doesn't it? The same thing when you link. Yeah. So. What I, from what I've read, whether this is correct or not, but it makes sense that we, you know, obviously the site's going to lose the authority from, you know, from linking in and out, etc., as a result of Google hosting it. Mm -hmm. so, which is why I think Semrush like highlight it is a issue by <laughs> sites that are old. Because yeah. I mean, I'm talking like this. This one particular site's hard coded, and it's got thousands of. Um, thousands of pages that are ramp and they're just and it's just flagging it up and I'm wondering why that is. Um because potentially it may be something that I can go in with the you know and a highlight to the client as one of the things that I need to sort out for them. 
Yeah. Uh, what I'm thinking anyway. Um, and if it's related to this mobile first thing, you know, if they're going to prioritize mobile first, thing, then, you know, Google, potentially Google's going to be like hosting the entirety of this person's site. <laughs> so <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think they're going to like the whole mobile first thing. I have a pretty good idea that is only going to be true if it's on mobile search. And for those of you that don't know what the AMP pages are, AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. So it's like having Google host your mobile pages so they can accelerate them and load them quick. We've actually found that, that slow loading pages don't rank well in mobile. And it's also translated into regular desktop as well. So what we've done is we actually opened a new hosting division where we offer optimized WordPress server hosting. And because a lot of sites run on WordPress and WordPress is great because they've got all of these templates and stuff where they're, they're mobile responsive. So you could create one site, have it be mobile responsive using WordPress. The problem with WordPress is when you load WordPress on a normal cPanel server, it runs very slow because most cPanel servers are not optimized to run WordPress quickly. WordPress is a very heavy program. It's, it's very labor intensive on the server if the server's not configured right. And if you configure the server for WordPress, it kills all the other web, website platforms. So most people will put them on a C, cPanel server, which is optimized down the middle of the road for everything. And it really sucks for WordPress as far as load speed. So we've actually got site, or we have servers now specifically for WordPress that are optimized for speed, just like the AMP pages. And anybody that's running WordPress, I encourage them to get on those servers that we have. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're well worth it because your site's going to load fast and it's going to rank well. I mean, that's worth a few bucks a month more. <laughs> and, you know, so if, you've, if you're on cheap web hosting and you're on one of those overloaded cPanel servers and you're running, you know, a WordPress site, you know, get get ready to, to have some some decline in ranking if you're not already there because of that. But, you know, back to the mobile first thing, saying if you don't have mobile, you're not going to rank anywhere. I don't, I don't believe that's true. And just the fact that, you know, in SEM Rush, you can toggle between and you can actually see your ranking for mobile versus desktop. It tells me there's two separate ranking algorithms in play depending on the device that you're using. So I think it's a great idea to focus on mobile and because it's so important and there's so many users now and, and if it's not really part of your plan, it, it should be. So. Okay. Cheers, John. Thanks. All right. Awesome. So, so anyway, back to, back to the big idea, just so I can, you know, wrap this up. Uh, the big idea is a process of how to grab attention. And there's three components to it. We could spend a whole hour just on that. But what, what I probably think would be more beneficial, I've already covered it in detail in the videos, and I put a tutorial in there as well. There's a tutorial with like 30 different examples of big ideas and in each one, I break down the three components of what's important about it. You know, like the intrigue piece, the unique mechanism. Unique mechanism is like the thing that delivers the result. That's where you can call something something unique. You know, that's where you want to come up with things that are unique just to you. Even if it's the same thing and you just call it something different. But I cover that really well, you know, in that video and in the tutorials. And it's really important that you get your head wrapped around that whole big idea process. And then, you know, if you guys have questions about it, pop in here next week and, you know, we'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions about lead magnets and, and big ideas. But those are two things that you really need to master is the lead magnet. And the big idea really is how you grab their attention to want the lead magnet. So. Anyway, that's, uh, 
that's the stuff, I, you know, between last week and this week, I, I wanted to cover both of those things, the big idea and the lead magnets. And, and I think we're there, but I, I really would encourage you guys to go back into the training and at least watch that on the, on the big idea and look at the tutorial, the different examples that are in there. And uh, we've got a worksheet now where you can, it, it kind of guides you through the process. And I'm doing, I'm doing those. I'm actually creating big ideas for all the apprentices that are in the apprentice level. And it, it's so easy for me when they fill out the worksheet and they give me the pieces. Writing the copy for me is really easy if you do the legwork and, you know, give me the pieces out of the research. So anyway, guys, uh, that's it for this week. I think we've covered everything. Oh, one more. Cheryl wants to know about the interns again. I put the link to how to get the, the free interns in the resources page. I also emailed it out to everybody, so you guys should all have the link. If you don't, it's simple. It's internetdominators.com forward slash intern. And basically, it's a way to get free interns to work in your business the deal is it's, it's a give and take with the interns. What they want is they want training. They want to, they want experience. So you can't just like throw them in and say, Hey, I want you to do this and figure it out. And you're all on your own. That's not the way it works. So what I've offered everybody is if you want to put them into the act program and let me train them for you, I can even, you can put them on the calls here. I'll answer their questions. I will provide the value for them getting what they need to get for them to do what you want them to do. So like, let's say big idea, you need a big idea. Get your intern to go through, watch the big idea video, go through the tutorial, and, and then create a big idea for you out of what they learned. That's a great use of it. Uh, if you need keyword research, let them go through, let them learn the keyword research portion through the training. Let them do the keyword research for you. That's the thing. You're providing them training to do a job. So I've got a ton of training in here. If it's stuff you need done, this is a perfect thing to get these interns to do it for you. I've provided the training for them for you. So have them do the training and then have them do the, the job for you. And you can get really cool stuff. You can get really good results out of these. These are marketing students. So they have knowledge of marketing already. They're just, they just need a little more training and some firsthand, uh, you know, practical knowledge. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the, the deal with the interns. And that's, uh, I think that's it for me. Anybody else? Any last questions before we wrap up today? All right, guys. Well, have a great week. And uh, I appreciate you all being on here and making this a, a great call and a great resource. So we'll talk to you next week.